the UN Office for Sustainable Development, UNOSD, in Incheon, Republic of Korea. I'd like to welcome and thank you all for joining the 2020 International Mayors Forum entitled Local Governments and the Sustainable Development Goals in Times of the COVID-19 Pandemic. Cities and towns are closely linked to sustainable development. As you know, they accommodate more than half of the global population. And this, uh, and this share is expected to reach 60% by 2030 at the current rate of urbanization. They also contribute to 60% of the global GDP. They are at the art of local action, one of the three levels of action together with global and people action through which the UN Secretary General called all sectors of society to mobilize for the accelerated delivery of the global goals during the decade of action. The general objective of the International Mayor's Forum is to provide a platform for policy dialogue and knowledge sharing through presentation and discussions on key aspects related to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, at local level. This forum is meant to, to help achieve a better understanding of progress, gaps, challenges, lessons learned, and specific mechanisms that can accelerate the sustainable transformation needed to make our societies more inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. <clears throat> Previous editions of the International Mayor's Forum were held in Asia, in Africa. We had planned to hold the one Mayor's Forum in Latin America during the, the fall last year, in Ecuador, actually, uh, but we had to cancel it at the last minute. Our intention was, is, to hold the mayor's forums successively in different regions and continents in rotation. This year, we were supposed to hold the mayor's forum in Incheon last May. But as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic made us change our course slightly. In the current context of the pandemic, the 2020 International Mayor's Forum aims to examine the social, economic, and environmental impact of the uh, current crisis on cities and local governments and identify potential solutions for sustainable responses. It also aims to provide local governments and local actors with knowledge to support a swift recovery from the COVID-19 crisis and advance the delivery of the sustainable development goals in the decade of action. The past editions of the International Mayor's Forum were in-person or face-to-face -face meetings held over three to four days. But because of the COVID-19, however, we had to adapt the format and schedule to allow coverage of the teams we normally address during such meetings. Therefore, this International Mayor's Forum has been taking place through a series of virtual meetings, out of which Six webinars have already been delivered between September and October, just before this official meeting we have today. I'd like to share with you the topics of the past six webinars, which we were all linked uh, to everyday life issues and meant to help local governments and local actors to accelerate the delivery of the related SDGs and COVID-19 recovery. Well, the first one was accelerating decent work and economic growth or a resilient urban recovery in the era of COVID-19. Second, local governments, the climate crisis and the green recovery from COVID-19. Third, delivering basic services to leave no one behind, closing the wash gap. Four, leaving no one behind gender equality, and women's empowerment in our cities and communities. Five, impact investments in cities, innovations to finance the 2030 agenda locally. And sixth, leaving no one behind, person with disabilities and addressing inequalities in our cities and communities. In the interest of time, I will not elaborate further on these. You can find these re reports and uh, recordings of the first series of webinars on the UNOSD website at https colon 
double slash unosd.org. We will hold additional webinars or virtual and in-person capacity building events in the coming weeks and months. These events will complement the Mayor's Forum with the same goal of supporting local governments in their efforts for a swift and sustainable recovery from COVID-19 pandemic and advance the delivery of the global goals. Now we will hear our distinguished opening speakers and panelists of diverse background from across the world who are involved in one way or another in making our cities and communities more inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Before we do so, I'd like to remind the speakers and presenters to keep their speech and presentations within the allotted time as we have a very tight schedule. Also, please kindly uh, mute your microphone when not speaking to ensure minimal background noise while others are presenting and or speaking. As well, there's a parallel chat during the forum. Please feel free to use it and engage with the audience and also answer questions during the Q&A and also react to other panelists' presentations. I would also like to invite the audience to make use of parallel chat and Q&A to ask questions and share your comments. For instance, one request I have for everyone is to share your ideas on local government's needs for a capacity development to which we could potentially respond for future activities such as the International Mayor's Forum. Thank you. Um, now I would like to uh, start. Uh, let's start with the opening remarks of Mr. Chung Kyo Park, head of UNOSD. First, I'd like uh, just to say, uh, I'd like to say that uh, before joining uh, UNOSD, Mr. Chung Kyo Park has served as the gov uh, at the government of, for almost 30 years, mainly at the Ministry of Environment of the Republic of Korea, where he joined in 1991 starting at mid-level management, rising to the rank of Vice Minister of Environment. Mr. Park's works range from a air and water quality management to nature conservation, waste management, chemicals management, sewage system, etc. Tackling climate change has been his major concern and produced lots of achievements at the ministry, including setting up Korean national uh, mitigation targets. His career includes international cooperation as he worked as the first secretary of the Republic of Korea mission to the UN, where he was in charge of works related to the UN General Assembly Second Committee and the Commission on Sustainable Development. He graduated from Yonsei University majoring in public administration and holds master's degrees in development policy and public administration at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He's the co-author of several books, including Carbon Market, Are You Ready to Buy or Sell It? Uh, Mr. Uh, Park, please uh, go ahead. The microphone is yours. Okay, oh, thank you, John. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers and colleagues, welcome and thank you all for joining the 2020 International Mayor's Forum. On behalf of the United Nations Office for Sustainable Development, I would like to especially welcome our distinguished partners and speakers, to name a few. His Excellency Mr. Myung Lee Cho, Minister of Environment of the Republic of Korea, His Excellency Mr. Nam Chun Park, Mayor of Incheon Metropolitan City, Mr. Amson Sibanda, our co my colleague, Chief National Strategist and Corporate Building Branch, DSDG Yuan Dessa, Mr. Zhang Pierre Ulong Umbashi, Secretary General, United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG Africa, Ms. Bernadia Irawati, Secretary General, UCLG Asia Pacific, Ms. Joselina Hardoy, President, International Institute for Environment and Development of Latin America. Mr. Tajushige Endo, Director, United Nations Center for Regional Development. Mr. Changyong Pra, K. Water, Court of Power Korea. Ms. Caroline Lombardo, and Ms. Nina Jusilla, and Mr. Daniel Praj from UNDESA as well. 
As you are very aware, the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated many of the challenges local authorities face, with an estimated 90% of all reported COVID-19 cases taking place in urban areas. While this pandemic has disrupted essential public services, Local governments have been playing a critical role as frontline responders, ensuring continued access to daily necessities and in crafting the recovery and rebuilding basis they follow. They follow. Nevertheless, local government must also cope with the increasing intensity of climate-related disasters. Almost every other day, we see news stories on how flooding, hurricanes, drought, and more intensify the difficulties of tackling the pandemic, which is the growing, uh, it is the growing uh, arguments that climate change hit hard and unequally to the vulnerabilities. How local governments respond to the COVID-19 recovery and the climate crisis is linked to the feasibility of meeting the Paris Agreement's targets. Amid this climate crisis, urban centers will continue to grow in size from 4.4 billion urban citizens today to 6.7 billion in 2050. As a result, local governments need priority support to achieve the sustainable goals in this decade of action and build resilience to the growing complexity of risk faced today. During the 2013 Inter City Summit, UN always organized its first activity to build the capacity of local governments for sustainable development. The International Symposium on Sustainable Cities concluded that then, with the adoption of the Inter Accord calling for UN OSD, to convene a forum for sustainable city, cities every two years. This has added to the importance of the International Mayor's Forum as a flagship activity of our organization. Since then, we have convened the International Mayor's Forum in host cities such as Nilongwe, Malawi, and Bientian, Lao PDR, organizing every two years to strengthen local, local implementation and achievement of the SDGs. Today, I address you from Incheon Metropolitan City, our host city for the 2020 International Mayor's Forum. Prior to the uh, forum today, we organized six preparatory webinars on key areas of interest for local actors as the key principle of the 2030 agenda, four webinars focus on leaving no one behind, to name a few, decent work for water, sanitation, hygiene, while two other webinars focus on the climate crisis and financial innovations for a resilient economy. Through these preparatory webinars, we are able to create a platform for dialogue, knowledge sharing, and exchange solutions with a global audience. We had over 550 participants and distinguished speakers from across the UN agencies, national to local government and civil society, some of which I'm happy to welcome here again today. As we open our 22 International Mayors Forum, I would like to underscore that local governments are already taking action to recover better from the pandemic, but more, much more must be done to strengthen the capacities of local governments for a green, inclusive, and resilient economic recovery that will transform cities and address the climate and pollution crises. These are the, the words of our UN General, uh, UN Secretary General, His Excellency Antonio Guterres, and this is our focus for today. Through the insights of insights our distinguished speakers will share today, we, we, we will examine how we can do more to strengthen the capacities of local governments to achieve the sustainable development goals. I invite you all to share your reflections and engage in the discussion. Once again, 
Thank you so much for your comments on this issue, and I wish you all a fruitful 2020 Intelligent Math program and very good health. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Park, uh, Head of Office, UNOSD, for your opening remarks. Uh, now I would like to um, present you the, the congratulatory uh, remarks will, will be delivered by His Excellency Mr. Myung Ri Cho, uh, Minister of the Republic of Korea. He, Mr. Myung Ri, uh, Myung Ri Cho, he, he, he was a uh, former president of the Korea Environment Institute and also, served as, and also served as the president of the National Committee on Sustainable Development of Seoul. Uh, His Excellency Mr. Myung Ri Cho received his uh, Bachelor in uh, Regional Development at Dangguk University in the Republic of Korea and earned uh, a Master's in uh, environmental planning at the Seoul National University Graduate School of Environmental Studies. He also received a master's and a PhD in urban planning uh, at the uh, University of Sussex in the UK. So uh, without further ado, uh, we will uh, play his uh, video. Kuchesianforumegetirchadrinida. 포럼에 참석하는 유엔 경제사회 이사국을 비롯한 유엔 관계자분들과 국제 지방 정부 연대 각국의 시장 군수 여러분께도 인사 말씀을 전합니다. 유엔 OSD는 2018년부터 지속하는 발전 목표 이행에 도시가 갖는 중요성에 주목하며 국제 시장 포럼을 개최해 왔다고 들었습니다. 특히 올해의 주제는 코로나 19 시대의 지방 정부와 지속하는 발전 목표입니다. 인류에 의한 기후 변화와 지구 생태계의 교란은 코로나 19 팬데믹이라는 새로운 위기로 돌아와 인류의 건강과 생명을 위협하고 있습니다. 따라서 코로나 19로부터 회복하는 과정은 화석 연료에 의존하고 환경을 파괴하는 방식에서 벗어나야 합니다. 코로나 19 위기를 보다 지속 가능하고 포용적인 미래를 만드는 데 활용해야 합니다. 이런 차원에서 한국 정부는 지난 7월 16일 한국판 뉴딜 종합계획의 주요 축으로 그린 뉴딜을 발표하였습니다. 인프라와 에너지의 녹색 전환과 녹색 산업 혁신을 통해 탄소 중립 사회를 지향하는 한국형 그린 뉴딜은 세계 최초로 구체적인 재정 계획을 포함한 실행 가능한 전략입니다. 지난 10월 28일 문재인 대통령께서 국회 시정연설에서 2050 탄소 중립 목표를 선언했으며 한국 정부는 금년 말까지 장기 저탄소 발전 전략을 마련하여 유엔에 제출하기 위해 준비 중에 있습니다. 특히 한국의 경우 지방 정부가 기후 변화에 대해 매우 적극적인 역할을 하고 있습니다. 올해 6월 한국의 모든 기초 지자체가 대한민국 기초 지방정부 기후위기 비상선언을 하였고 이어서 7월에는 탄소중립 지방정부 실천연대가 발족되었습니다. 또한 도시의 녹색 전환을 지원하기 위한 사업으로 환경부는 스마트 그린 도시라고 하는 프로그램을 운영하고 있습니다. 스마트 기술과 녹색 기술을 활용하여 기업의 기후환경 문제를 해결하는 다양한 사례를 수집하여 발전시킬 예정입니다. 국제시장 포럼이 근본에는 온라인으로 개최되지만 내년에는 한국에서 오프라인으로 개최될 예정이라고 들었습니다. 다음번 국제시장 포럼에서 스마트 그린 도시의 다양한 사례들도 공유될 수 있기를 기대하겠습니다. 오늘 포럼에서 
지속가능 발전 목표 이행을 위해 도시와 지방정부가 어떤 역할을 수행해야 하는지 다양한 지방정부의 사례와 노력이 잘 공유되기를 바라겠습니다. 짧은 시간이지만 힘도 있고 건설적인 논의가 이루어지기를 바랍니다. 참석해 주신 모든 분들의 건강과 행복을 기원합니다. 감사합니다. I would like to uh, thank uh, the, uh, His uh, Excellency Mr. Myung Rae Cho for uh, a congratulatory remarks. And, and now I would like to also to uh, give you a, a bit of the background. We have the uh, welcome remarks from the uh, Honorable Mr. Nam Chung Park, Mayor of the Incheon Metropolitan City. So Mr. Uh, uh, Nam Chung Park is is the mayor of Incheon City. He, is, uh, he was the former chairman of the Democratic Party of the Incheon Division of the Republic of Korea and served as the member of the 19th and 20th National Assembly in the Republic of Korea. He also uh, he was appointed as vice chairman of the Policy Committee for the Demo Democratic Party and took several positions as the presidential office, as the senior presidential secretary for personal management, per Presidential Secretary for Personal Affairs and the Chief Officer for State Affairs. Uh, Honorable Mr. Nam Chung Park received uh, his Bachelor in Public Administration at the, at the Korea University in the Republic of Korea and the Master of Science in International Transport at the University of Wales in the United Kingdom. So uh, we can play the video now. I'm very pleased to be with you today. I am Park Nam Shun, Mayor of Incheon Metropolitan City. Mr. Chun Yu Park, Head of United Nations Office for Sustainable Development. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it is an, our honor to welcome you all to this 2020 International Mayors Forum taking place in Incheon. We should keep physical distancing to prevent the COVID-19 infections. However, the world should strongly unite to fight the pandemic and achieve the sustainable development goals. Today's forum is one of such efforts. Despite physical distancing and the risk to debate time, I wish you all lively exchanges during this mayor's forum. The world is fighting an uphill battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic poses a tremendous threat to the safety of people and the sustainable development. Therefore, local governments at the forefront should play a central role in this fight. Based on this, that this forum will examine environmental and socio-economic strategies that can be implemented by local governments to overcome the COVID-19 and the delivery of sustainable development goals. In line with our government's Korean New Deal policy, Incheon has designed Incheon New Deal, aiming at ensuring a balanced growth and job creation. Particularly, we have taken a giant step toward the carbon neutral society by recently joining the powering Past Coal Alliance. It has begun a great transition toward an eco friendly resource circulation by urging the closure of metropolitan landfill site, where waste are still directly buried in an outdated manner. We fully support 15 international organizations, including the UNOSP, operating in Incheon to fulfill our role and responsibilities globally. We will employ proposals and opinions produced from this forum for better Incheon and Korea. Also, Incheon will keep cooperating with the UNOSB for the sustainable development of international society. This year's forum is taking place through a series of webinars due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. It is my greatest wish that we'll overcome this hardship soon, and I will be able to welcome you all to a face-to-face -face mayor's forum in Incheon in the near future. Thank you. Uh, 
and like to uh, thank uh, uh, the Honorable Mayor Park Namchul uh, for his welcoming remarks. And now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Anson Sivanda, Chief National Strategies and Capacity Building Branch at the Division for Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, well known as UNDESA. And before he starts, I would like to uh, say a few words. He's, uh, beside uh, being the chief, Mr. Uh, Anson Sibanda has over 15 years of progressively responsible experience in a broad range of sustainable development issues at the global, regional, and national levels, including the various intergovernmental processes uh, that underpin his work. Mr. Sibanda holds a doctorate and a master's in demography from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, and a uh, master in science in popula population studies, and bachelor in geography from the University of, University of Zimbabwe. So, uh, Mr. Sivanda, please uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, the mic is yours. Thank you, Jean. Uh, excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by thanking the United Nations Office for Sustainable Development and all those involved in organizing the 2020 International Mayors Forum. This platform provides an opportunity for cities and local governments from around the world to discuss new ideas and issues of mutual interest, including the common challenges they face implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its Sustainable Development Goals. As we gather here today, the world is not on track to achieve the 2030 Agenda. Poverty, hunger, and inequality are on the rise, and job losses continue to mount. The digital divide threatens to cause irreparable damage to the hopes and aspirations of millions of children without access to affordable technological devices and services. Some of the gains we had made since the adoption of the 2030 Agenda have been wiped out by the COVID-19 crisis in a matter of months. Hence, this platform provides opportunities to cities and law governments to scale and advance the implementation of the SDGs at the local level by sharing and promoting locally appropriate SDG acceleration and innovative actions, aligning SDGs with local plans and strategies, building partnerships, raising awareness at the local level of what SDGs are, and ensuring that we promote the collection and analysis of disaggregated, timely, and accurate data that supports the design of policies and interventions that are relevant to the lives of urban inhabitants. I might add, the objectives of this platform are also aligned with those of Local 2030 a network and platform that supports the on-the-ground delivery of the SDGs with a focus on those furthest behind. The theme you have selected, local governments and the sustainable development goals in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic is quite timely. In many ways, it underscores that the success of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development hinges on implementing bold and inclusive local actions and effective collaboration between all relevant actors, including local and regional governments, civil society and community-based organizations, and the private sector. Furthermore, efforts to localize the implementation and follow-up of the 2030 Agenda can also succeed if genuine and inclusive efforts are made to promote the participation of local and regional governments in voluntary national reporting, monitoring, and evaluation. A review of the voluntary national reviews that were presented during this year's high-level political forum on sustainable development has shown that coordinating mechanisms at multiple levels of government, including local government, are important in many countries as the implementation of the SDGs relies on the concrete application of programs and policies at the local level, requiring effective vertical alignment between national and local government. However, challenges remain in making these arrangements as effective as possible. Hence, 
it is platforms like the International Mayors Forum that must closely examine the, these gaps and challenges that have been further compounded by the COVID crisis and come up with concrete solutions to tackle them. Ladies and gentlemen, following the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, we have all seen how cities, towns, and local governments have borne the brunt of this pandemic, which has since morphed into a debilitating economic and social crisis. As the Secretary General noted in his policy brief on COVID-19 in an urban world, this pandemic has laid bare and heightened the many challenges that have been brought about by the remarkable growth of cities in recent decades, particularly worsening social and economic inequalities and the growth of overcrowded and marginalized informal settlements. The pandemic has also presented many of our greatest opportunities to protect people, prosperity, and planet. During the initial round of this pandemic, an estimated 95% of cases were found in urban areas. Within cities, COVID-19 has not affected all neighborhoods or social groups the same. The pandemic has disproportionately fallen hardest on poor, overcrowded neighborhoods. A study carried out in July by Mumbai Municipality and the government think tank Niti Ayong and the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in India found out that over half of Mumbai's 7 million slum dwellers had been exposed to the novel coronavirus. The high prevalence rate in these informal settlements could be explained by a combination of several factors, including poverty, low incomes, overcrowded and inadequate housing, lack of access to clean water and sanitation, and healthcare. These are all areas where local governments can play a more significant role when it comes to improving service delivery, contributing to the achievement of the 2030 agenda. The COVID crisis has also inflicted huge economic pain on local governments, undermining their ability to finance the implementation of the 2030 agenda. At the beginning of the pandemic, local governments had to redirect existing expenditures towards emergency responses. And as the virus spread, they also began to implement measures to control the pandemic, such as business closures and lockdowns that further curtailed economic activity and the ability to raise revenues. Estimates from the World Bank and the United Nations system suggest that in 2021, local governments may on average lose 15 to 25 percent in revenues. Cities with less diversified economies, particularly those that depend on tourism, have been hit especially hard. The sharp decline in business and property taxes and other revenue streams over the past few months has compromised municipal governments' ability to provide, provide basic services and invest in public infrastructure, transport, and adequate and affordable housing. This has also led to cuts in critical public services, often worsening poverty and hunger, health outcomes, inequality, and social exclusion. With many businesses and civic activity shut down, some have wondered if cities will be able to survive and resume their role as central nodes of the global economy. New York City is dead forever. Here's why was the headline of one article written by James Altucher in August this year and was reprinted in the New York Post. While New York City and many cities around the world have been devastated by the COVID crisis, what this headline grabbing article missed is the resilience of local governments, businesses, and communities. If history is any lesson, COVID-19 is not the first pandemic or major crisis to devastate cities and towns. Cities such as New York were able to rebound, flourish, and experience a cultural renaissance following the devastating impact of the 1918 Spanish flu and the economic crisis such as the 2008 Great Recession. History has also taught us that cities are the places where good ideas on how to respond to crisis start. Because of the large concentration of people, including a highly educated workforce, cities are hubs of energy, resilience, and innovation. 
but for cities and local governments to harness and effectively leverage these advantages, policy choices matter, particularly with respect to public investments in, in universal, inclusive, and equitable access to safe, quality, effective, and affordable healthcare services, quality education, over the eradication, a new generation of social protection measures, combating inequalities, strengthening local government systems and capacity, and fostering a green, inclusive recovery. And as amply highlighted by the sacrifices of frontline workers during this pandemic, particularly health, healthcare workers, women, and low wage workers, cities and local governments must also scale up investments in the care economy. The crisis also highlights the imperative for cities and local governments to rethink their strategies promoting a green, inclusive, and resilient economic recovery. Local governments also need to fully implement the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction in order to reduce the risk of the economic, social, and environmental impacts of climate change and disasters. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 crisis highlights the critical role law governments play as frontline responders in crisis response, recovery, and rebuilding. They are also at the forefront of service delivery, economic development, and infrastructure investment. And as the number of people living in cities and towns continues to rise, we need to unlock opportunities for all urban inhabitants, including those left furthest behind, if we are to build back better and achieve the 23rd Agenda for Sustainable Development within the decade of action and delivery. Moving forward, let us continue to leverage the opportunities presented by the International Mayors Forum to further strengthen cooperation among national governments, cities, and local governments, and reinforce ties between local governments and the communities they serve. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Anson Sibanda, um, for uh, this very thoughtful uh, uh, speech. And uh, I would like also to thank the, uh, all the distinguished speakers for the opening statement, uh, statements. And thank you. And uh, now I would like to uh, introduce the, the next panelist. And um, as a matter of fact, Mr. Sibanda talked about the the voluntary uh, local reviews. Uh, then uh, our first panelist, Ms. Uh, Rina Drusila, will talk about localizing the SDGs at the subnational levels and introduce the uh, voluntary uh, local reviews, uh, the o, uh, as the VLRs. Uh, I'd like to say uh, a few words. So, Ms. Rina Drusila uh, joined the Division for Sustainable Development Goals of the United uh, Nations. Um, Department of uh, Economic and Social Affairs in 2012. She was part of the small core uh, secretariat team supported that um, inter event, internet, uh, sorry, intergovernmental uh, negotiation on the formulation of the Sustainable Development Goals and the, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And uh, in addition to supporting international uh, intergovernmental negotiation, Irina also worked on a range of topics such as monitoring and review of the SDG implementation, capacity building, stakeholder engagement, uh, and partnership. Uh, prior to joining the uh, UN Secretariat, Trina worked uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland. And at the ministry, she supported the uh, national preparation for United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development, also known as Rio uh, Plus 20 and the work of the Secretary General High uh, Level Panel on uh, Global Sustainability. Before a career in sustainable development, Rina worked for several years as a journalist. So welcome, uh, Rina, and uh, uh, the, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, and um, good evening and good morning to colleagues. First of all, of course, uh, many thanks to colleagues for inviting us to the Mayor's Forum, and I'm very happy to share our thoughts on the, on the new exciting movement that we call the Voluntary Local Reviews. Um, indeed, as you may have heard, the Voluntary Local Reviews conducted by cities and regions uh, are modeled after the Voluntary National Review Reports, 
and they are truly picking up pace around the world. Um, cities and regions as varied as New York City, Kita Kyushu, Buenos Aires and Helsinki have already conducted their reviews um, and tens of cities are in the in the midst of, of their process despite the COVID-19 pandemic. As Mr. Sifanda just noted, cities and regions are often the engines of innovation and we are quite excited to see how they will utilize this new tool for their SDG implementation. If you could change the next slide, please. Um, our Department of Economic and Social Affairs uh, serves as the Secretariat of the High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, the main platform for follow-up and review of SDG implementation. Um, while these VLRs, uh, they are not directly mandated by the, by the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, we really strongly believe that they can uh, drive the transformational change that we all desperately need. Um, for the cities and regions themselves, we believe that the voluntary local review can, for example, it can help raise awareness of the SDGs, first of all. They can support more integrated policy making and coordination within the government. It can serve as a catalyst for increased engagement with civil society, academia and private sector. It can help enhance data collection. It can serve as a communication tool between different levels of government. And they can also help in forging new partnerships and searching for new means of implementation. You could uh, change the slide, please. Um, UNDESA has from the start supported the voluntary national reviews, and we've organized peer learning workshops for the countries participating in this process annually. We've really noticed that the best experts in the process are those who have gone through the full cycle themselves or are preparing their reports. And this is why we wish to provide similar support for our colleagues working at the subnational level. We held the first global capacity building workshop online in June when we brought together cities and regions that have already conducted the VLR to share their experiences with those who are only starting the journey. We also had colleagues working for the national governments sharing their experiences from the voluntary national review processes. And we are now continuing this work through our thematic voluntary local review series. We have held so far two thematic online workshops, one on stakeholder engagement and another one on integrating the SDGs into strategies, plans and budgets. From our workshops, it has been very interesting to see and hear how many participants have depicted the SDGs truly as the new shared language, the lingua franca. They are really using the goals to connect with other cities and regions around the world for peer learning, as well as with individuals and international organizations that they would not otherwise reach out to. During the workshops, uh, participants have really stressed the importance of showcasing in very practical terms what is the added value of integrating the SDGs into their work. For some, they provide as a structure, uh, they provide a structure for setting priorities. Uh, for example, uh, the province of Cordoba in Argentina has utilized the SDGs to agree on six priority goals for immediate action. Others have utilized them to find gaps and weaknesses in their existing efforts, as has been showcased in the VLR, for example, of Los Angeles and its findings on public health. These types of uh, initiatives and work have also often brought up questions related to jurisdictions. Should progress be monitored by cities, counties, states or national governments when issues are often very, very interlinked? There are no right answers to these questions, but hopefully these VLRs can also help ignite discussions on these issues. The SDGs have also been used at the local level to reflect in everyday work whether existing actions are taking into consideration environmental, social and economic decisions and to showcase their interlinkages with other targets. In some cases, the VLR report itself has been a part of the integration process. For example, in Helsinki, Finland, the first VLR served more as a stock-taking exercise, while before the second VLR, now in the making, the city is working on further integration. Our cities and regions, of course, all operate in very different contexts. For example, on SDG integration, some national governments, such as Argentina and Ecuador, have given direct guidance to subnational entities on how to include these goals into their strategies and plans. In other countries, active subnational governments have initiated the process independently. And in many cases, these processes at the local level can be very participatory. 
bringing together individuals from around the community consider the shared priorities of the city. This was done, for example, in Mannheim, Germany, where the city um, developed its 2030 mission statement. And it was developed through a series of surveys, workshops, online consultations and debates. As part of the process, the mayor of Mannheim held himself dialogues with citizens to discuss what actions should be prioritized by the city. Related to this, um, we have heard through, uh, through our workshops how local action and the VLRs can really provide avenues for participation that are impossible to achieve at the national level. They can extend a hand to actors who otherwise would not be participating in this work, reach out to the most vulnerable and marginalized groups and help amplify their voices. For example, in Bristol, United Kingdom, the multi-stakeholder SDG Alliance has been used to bring in actors that wouldn't otherwise engage in sustainability projects. And initiatives such as city leadership breakfasts bring together city leaders from anchor entities with communities to discuss the challenges faced by the city. In the city of Kitakyushu in Japan, the new SDGs club is open for all stakeholders, and it also provides funding for, for projects developed by the citizens. Through this mechanism, all citizens can propose how to solve local sustainability challenges. These are the encounters that really turn the SDGs into a reality. And these are the initiatives we can learn from and get inspired by through these discussions and through the VLRs themselves. Uh, we will be holding the next workshop on 20th of January, focusing on monitoring data and indicators. And we expect to have very interesting discussions on how cities and regions have localized the global SDG indicators for their own work. What indicator sets and support from international entities they have found very useful and how they can contribute to the national efforts of monitoring progress. Next slide, please. Um, colleagues, while there is no official format for the VLRs, we have learned from the national processes that certain shared elements drawing from the 2030 agenda itself can enrich the peer learning and contribute to the robustness of the reviews. Hence, we have developed a global guiding elements uh, for the VLRs, which draw from the Secretary General's common voluntary guidelines for the VNRs. These elements merely aim at providing a proposed, proposed shared structure for the reports, and at a minimum, they give a checklist of issues that could be reflected in the process, even if they are not showcased in the report itself. The elements are really not meant as restrictions to the process, but rather as a tool for those engaging in these reviews. And they are fully compatible with other more detailed guidance materials, such as the Asia Pacific Regional Guidelines prepared by UNSCAP. We have made them available online and we will have them translated into all official UN languages, hopefully by the end of the year. These global guiding elements also aim at fostering a dialogue between the voluntary national reviews and the voluntary local reviews, wherever it is applicable. On this issue, we have been very happy to see more and more national level reviews refer to meaningful collaboration with subnational governments. And this year for the first time also to these VLRs, as was done by countries such as Kenya, Uganda and Finland. We know that many of the 2021 VNR countries are already working with their subnational counterparts to utilize the findings from these VLR, VLRs in their reports. So, um, as mentioned, we believe that cities and regions really hold the potential for being the game changers in our SDG efforts. We expect that these VLRs can become a driving force when taking a deep dive to assess our SDG impact at the local level and to see if the goals are really making the difference in everyday lives of people around the world. To close, I would just like to note that it's of course important that to remember that all these reviews, um, the process is much more important than the report itself. Transformative change, it requires that all of us are willing to make an honest effort to assess the current state of our actions and to make the changes needed afterward. The true value of a review will only be measured in ways in which it enhances SDG implementation and true sustainability of our societies on the ground. I thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Avilina. Uh, um, I'm just uh, thinking that uh, this is very, uh, very important. Uh, the the, um, the VLRs are very important because we know that many of the SDG targets 
are depending on local actors. So this is well known, and this is also, I, I noted that you said that you are developing, you have been developing uh, the guidelines uh, based on the, the VNRs. Uh, it's a, I think it's very important to have a common uh, structure also for, for um, I mean, a common language, a common structure to uh, um, uh, report on, on the VNR. So thank you so much. And I think we have a small uh, uh, problem now with the second panelist. We have, we'll go to the third panelist for now. So I would ask uh, Ms. Bernardia, uh, Ira Wati Chandra Dewi uh, to prepare. And I will uh, give you a bit of a background of uh, uh, Ms. Bernardia. I'm just looking at my notes now. Sorry for uh, this. Then, yes. So Dr. Bernardia, uh, Irawati Chandra Dewi is the first woman secretary general of the USULG uh, Asia Pacific region. She um, she has been working on in urban development. Oops. Thank you, Rina. I think I saw you now. See you on the screen. So um, she has been working on uh, in urban development and related fields for more than 15 years. She began her career at the Japan International Corporation or JICA and afterward uh, CityNet Yokohama. Um, Dr. Bernardia has also uh, been a visiting professor in several universities in Japan and speaking at various international events. In 2015, she was appointed as a member of the advisory group on gender issues of UN Habitat. She was selected as one of the prominent women whose work uh, makes impacts in Asia Pacific in, in 2018 by the government Insider Asia. Her interests are on strategic urban planning, climate change, disaster management, water management, women empowerment, and uh, local governance. Uh, she received her PhD in urban engineering from the University of Tokyo and two master's degrees in atmospheric physics from Nagoya University in Japan and public policy from the National University of Singapore. As the Secretary General, Dr. Bernardia is the Chief Executive Officer of the UCLG Asia Pacific Section, and she directs the daily activities of the section and carries out the, um, uh, the decision of the Regional General Assembly, the Regional Council, and the Executive Bureau. So, Ms. Bernardia, uh, Please uh, take. You can take the mic and also the video, if you if you will. Okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for, for uh, your presentation in advance. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a very nice introduction. Anyong uh, aseo. Very good evening. Very good morning. Very uh, good afternoon. And greetings from uh, UCAG Aspak Secretariat at the City Hall of Jakarta, Indonesia. First of all, thank you once again for inviting me uh, in this uh, important forum. This is very, very uh, crucial uh, as we are talking about this, uh, how this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, very much relate to this uh, uh, acceleration of edits uh, uh, by 2030. So um, uh, in, in the next slide, um, uh, let me just uh, share with you that uh, Asia Pacific is the largest regional section of UCHG. We are covering almost 3.76 uh, billion uh, people. And then uh, uh, we are connecting more than 10,000 cities, local governments at the global level, around 250,000 cities and local governments. And the next slide, um, the, the COVID pandemic uh, demonstrated that the narrow focus on small set of hazard by one or two government agency is not enough is not enough to prevent or even respond to the complexity of the disaster risk. So this is why the key lessons uh, that we learned from the pandemic is that this crisis of this magnitude requires a fundamental shift, a fundamental shift in a risk governance at the local level. And we know that the local governments play a crucial role. Uh, they are the frontliner of this uh, response and recover from the COVID-19. and. I think we know that several mayors also uh, and high level official uh, at the local level have died uh, 
uh, because of the COVID. I think this is uh, quite uh, important to know that um, uh, as a frontliner, what kind of a capacity is needed? How can we have a, com a very good communication tool and strategies uh, in, in, in uh, handling this? Uh, I think the challenges are very huge and local governments in each country face different challenges uh, uh, that limited also uh, of the cross-sectoral cooperation, conflict of interest, and also trade-offs and implementing energy uh, agenda and as well as the uh, different kind of conducive environment uh, that uh, uh, local governments have in every country. So um, we also see uh, uh, raising awareness difficulties uh, and, and and when we, we look at the challenges, uh, I think caused by COVID, uh, there is also economic crisis uh, on the informal sector, particularly small medium enterprises where almost 80% uh, of uh, uh, employees are women uh, this also has been very, very much affected. And of course, we see that inequality is widening, gender equality and women equality must be attained. And the COVID is not just about health issue, it's about economic issue, it's about the social issue, because we see also the impact is quite huge uh, in gender uh, aspect as well, uh, with the high domestic violence and some places are more than even 300% increase. So the progress has been uneven. So, um, uh, and we also clearly see that the urban areas have become the epicenter of the COVID-19. So I'm happy that uh, this forum addresses the importance of cities uh, uh, and local governments in attaining these uh, uh, SDGs as well as, uh, I mean, during the COVID pandemic. So in the next slide, I'll, I'll just show you examples um, because this is the important time for local governments to reset to reset the uh, uh, targets of energies because we know that uh, local revenue has been going down very sharply uh, because of the uh, lack of income uh, from tax uh, or um, you know what, what kind of uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, this is why it's important that resetting the goals and focus on the energies by looking at the priority areas that local governments have or cities have. So this is an example how uh, short-term development focus uh, to attend SDGs by looking at several targets, several SDGs, not only one SDG, but several SDGs. Uh, you can see also comprehensive social protection system. I think this all very much relevant to what local governments are now doing uh, so that the responses as well as the recovery plans should be connected very closely to SDGs uh, attainment. And here you can see also tourism has been affected uh, badly. And this is uh, why one of the important uh, target include the tourism promotion and marketing through different kind of uh, uh, systems. Uh, so in the next slides, um, you see, uh, next slide please. This, uh, there are fundamental aspects to support and encourage local government achieving SDGs targets. One of the important uh, um, uh, aspect is about uh, having as many as possible a knowledge hub and coordination uh, platform to provide best practices. I think UCLG uh, and Metropolis have been collecting almost 500 best practices during this pandemic uh, that could be a good lesson learned for uh, many uh, cities and local governments all over the world. That's, and UCLG ASPAC has also created a quick guide to how local governments should respond to this COVID. So the other aspect, this is a channeling local governments with the private sector. I think financing has been uh, very much uh, um, badly affected. So that's why uh, several options on financing is crucial uh, to, to sustain and achieve SDGs targets uh, and if watch. And another one is providing a wide range of training and capacity improvement, especially in this uh, uh, short period of time between six to one years, uh, what kind of uh, alignment needed and how can we, the, the, there is a need to reset this uh, uh, SDGs. And the other aspect is development of VLR. I think Rina has mentioned uh, very clearly about the VLR. Um, and soon we are preparing also what we call it VSR, maybe for some of you, uh, this is quite new terms, as a voluntary sub-national review, basically not only looking at one individual city or one individual local governments, but 
looking at the several uh, type of local government or sub-national governments in the country. So we are preparing three uh, uh, PSRs uh, in Asia as uh, 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 the countries are preparing for submission of the PNR uh, next year. This includes Pakistan, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And importantly, facilitate the engagement of local governments in the PNR, Poland, the national review processes, because the data show that only 45% of PNRs have engaged local governments. So in the next slides, I I'm going to run very fast because my time is ending. So local initiatives um, really, really a lot uh, in mitigating COVID-19 impacts. This includes also improvement of supply chains uh, by having a food resilience systems, uh, like for example, basic uh, goods on the wheel and Iriga city in the Philippines that has also been transformed to other cities in the Philippines. And then also economic and stimulus package, safety net program. This is example of Jeju. And there are so many examples of the Korean cities that we have also gathered and then have been uh, transferred to several uh, website sessions and technology digital services and now local governments are pushed uh, to works uh, and to improve uh, digitalize uh, uh, their digital systems one example include the linking of the traditional markets uh, uh, through this uh, 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 digital system because when uh, when we look at the small medium enterprises in indonesia for example only 10 percent only 10 percent of the entire small medium enterprises are connected to digital market. So this is a big opportunity for, 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 for many local guns. So data synchronization has been a big, big, big challenge. So what the local governments have been uh, doing is that they develop local uh, hub, uh, data local hub, that improve also uh, not only looking at the basic information like number of hospital, number of affected people, but also having what they call it uh, uh, effective uh, uh, a safety net program for the needed people and the other one is community engagement grassroots voluntarily we see so much solidarity in the urban areas particularly uh, uh, there are several examples like, like for example neighbor, neighborhood initiative in central java watching their neighbors and support uh, each other during this pandemic so next uh, slides um, i think i have only three more minutes to go so UCL just back effort in aligning lo local governments with response and recovery within the SDGs. Uh, we foster knowledge, knowledge exchange uh, and also having a local government's uh, solidarity. Uh, uh, donation uh, have been also facilitated and uh, many, many cities also have been contributing to uh, supporting other cities and capture smart practices of local government documenting and promotion of smart practices of local governments in handling this uh, COVID-19. Advocacy and policy recommendation, ongoing research, and come up with a policy recommendation. The other one uh, important aspect is fostering opportunity, is taping alternative financing. I will give you later example on that. Right? Next, um, next, please. Uh, finding to inform uh, uh, policies. We uh, UCLG ASPAC is working with development practitioners, research institutions. DG centers in Indonesia to provide uh, evidence-based policy recommendations that support local government in addressing the pandemic situation. So financing the SDGs, uh, that includes also different kind of options uh, like uh, uh, private, uh, working with private sector zakat uh, and also different kind of uh, uh, arrangement to, to PPP uh, and demographic and social safety net uh, data needs to be synchronized uh, to ensure the most vulnerable and impacted groups are covered and financing analysis knowledge of local government official needs to be improved because this is also lack of capacity that we found in many many local governments so effective awareness campaign policy this is also we found very crucial because local governments have different kind of ways of communication with their people with their community and there are local leaders also that are very active so what we need is a very good communicative strategies for local governments uh, uh, during this uh, situation so that um, uh, health protocols can also be uh, applied uh, 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 during this time. Yeah? And next, um, uh, uh, next uh, I think this might be two more slides to go. Next, please. Sorry to take some time uh, to change the slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so economic recovery, sorry, economic recovery is a key. Uh, so tourism has been uh, uh, targeted here. 
and adapting focus to outdoor and natural tourist destination. We learn also from Korea, from Jeju particularly, how they shifted uh, to uh, uh, promote uh, domestic tourism and story economic uh, and storytelling uh, to improve the quality of tourism and addressing social impacts, ongoing assessment on the most uh, significant social impact from uh, the pandemic, including gender-based violence, increasing poverty, and local governments also have been providing much more uh, services uh, to support this uh, uh, gender uh, uh, domestic violence uh, uh, victims. So data synchronization for effective social safety, uh, safety net, uh, better data management, integration, and governance are needed to ensure the accuracy of data success through Satu Data Indonesia and collaboration. So collaboration has been a key uh, 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 aspect here. So there is also a need of having pentahelic model of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, point that uh, local governments, government alone cannot do. There is a need to communicate or to cooperate with businesses, media, academia, and as well as community. So we, 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 we need to have a new adaptive era in which pentahelic uh, model should be uh, strengthened. Ne in the next slide, um, um, hello? So these are examples. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm really uh, very happy to hear that several uh, global leaders uh, have made announcement of carbon neutrality uh, by 2050 or by 2060, like Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, uh, Prime Minister Suga, and also uh, a South Korea president uh, that declare uh, carbon neutrality. This has been also good news for cities and local governments because we really need a kind of commitment from the top leaders uh, in having uh, climate change uh, can be implemented at the local level. These are some examples, global government mayors for climate and energy in which uh, we are also uh, facilitation. We are acting as a secretariat of GCOM for Southeast Asia, as well as IUC and then a climate resilience. Uh, and my last slide, uh, I think this is conclusions uh, in this. Um, yeah. So key takeaways in accelerating the SDGs and, and the pandemic. Local governments uh, have taken various innovative solutions uh, in the pandemic, whatever situation they have. So partnership and collaboration we see very strongly uh, seen during the pandemic, uh, including the solidarity spirit that is very high in the urban areas and innovative and effective efforts in handling the pandemic matters uh, and building more resilient and sustainable cities. As the pandemic impacts all city sectors, handling the pandemic effectively can help to mitigate wider aspects of pandemic. This is the turning point now that we need to rethink, we need to redesign the way uh, our cities live and the way our cities uh, are designed. So integrated approach to ensure co-benefit, I think the most important is putting the right putting the money in the right basket, basket making uh, sure that the uh, infrastructure, uh, resilient infrastructure is put in place as extra cost for resilient, uh, building resilient infrastructure is only 3% uh, uh, of the extra cost uh, of uh, the overall in infrastructure uh, investment. But the net benefit can get almost 4.2 trillion US dollar um, uh, for the overall life lifespan of the infrastructure. I think this is the key. How can we show that there is a co-benefit in doing this resiliency? And the last one is mobilize resources through multi stakeholder approach and then local governments cannot do alone. Mobilizing resources beyond local government budget have never been critical than now. I think we need innovation, we need innovative ways uh, and creativities. Uh, there are already good examples uh, of uh, a good um, um, arrangement on the uh, building uh, sustainable cities uh, by having uh, um, public-private partnership, for example, in, in building solar panels, the highest solar panel in one of the cities uh, in Japan, in Hamamatsu, for example. Building back better, uh, recover to normal, bounce back does not always mean the best option. The pandemic provides an opportunity for us to reflect on lessons learned and to build back better and faster and stronger. So I think this is my end of uh, presentation and thank you, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you and over to you, moderator. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bernardia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is very, it, it was very interesting uh, presentation. You had uh, also good examples of local initiative to mitigate. I think it's important that we could also disseminate those in initiatives and then 
to, uh, to, to not only I mean lessons learned, but also the, those initiatives. It's important that we work more together. You you talk about partnership collaboration. We need to do more of that. So thank you very much for uh, this uh, very uh, interesting presentation. Um, I'd like to now to I'm not sure that we can go uh, with the Mr. Uh, Bassi. I'm here. I'm sure. You I'm are here. there. Okay. Yes, Good. I'm here. And and uh, I don't. Are you also with the camera or? Yes. Normally, yes. Yeah. Oh, I see you. I see you. So you are yeah. there. So yeah. welcome, uh, Mr. Jean-Pierre uh, Elong Bassi. I'd like just to say a few words, and then you are the Secretary General of the United Cities and Local Government of Africa, UCLG Africa, since 2007. Um, Mr. Um, Elong Bassi he has been a chairperson of Cities Alliance Interim Management Board till April 2016. He's the co-chair of the World City Scientific Development Alliance and Deputy Secretary General of the China Africa Forum for Local Go Government. Mr. Ilong Bessi is the man behind the Afri Cities Summit. We all know uh, this very important meeting. This is the largest, largest events of cities, regions, and local communities in Africa, in Africa, where he oversees the organization since the first edition in 1998. Mr. Ilong Bassi has a rich experience of nearly 40 years in the field of urban development and planning, urban services, local, local economic development, local governance, housing, and slum upgrading. From 1996 to 1991, he was the first Secretary General of the World Association of Cities and Local Authorities Coordination. At the same time, he held the position of Secretary General of the Municipal Development Partnership, MDP, from 1992 to 2006. Previously, from 1981 to 1991, uh, Mr. Elong Bassi was the director of the first urban project financed by the World Bank in Cameroon, which focused on the restructuring of development of a slum area of 300,000 inhabitants in the city of Douala, which is the economic capital of Cameroon. <laughs> Mr. Elong Bassi began his career in Paris, uh, France, where he was uh, responsible for research and project manager for uh, the Agency of Cooperation and Planning, or, or l'Agence de Coopération et Aménagement, uh, from 1973 to 1980. So, uh, Mr. Elong Bassi, it's an honor to have you uh, with us. And then I will uh, give you the mic and uh, I think your camera, you need to maybe to move a little bit your, your screen. Yes, I think we're, we're getting... It's uh, okay getting this way? Uh, a little bit more, if you will, if, you, if you're okay, because, yeah, a bit more. Again, you have to tilt it down towards you, because now we only... Yes, we... Whoops, it goes back. <laughs> or, uh, so we only, we only see the top of your head now. Oh, so man, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. better this way? It's a, now it's better. Now it's better. Okay, I'm sorry, but uh, you know, but tech, technology can sometimes be difficult to to, to handle. Uh, I thank you very much uh, for having invited the United Cities and local government of Africa to partake in this very important 2020 International Mayors Forum. As any city in the world, African cities have been hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. And our organization, the United States and Local Government of Africa, which is the umbrella organization of a subnational and uh, city government on the African continent, has been working hard with uh, our members to support them in dealing on the consequences of the pandemic on the population, as well as on city governments. From the experience of managing the COVID-19 in African cities, we draw the following eight lessons. Lesson number one, COVID has demonstrated that we are all part of a global human settlement and urban ecosystem. 
where uh, metropolises and major cities are the interface between the national urban system, the continental urban system, and the global urban system. This interface role makes the metropolises and major cities the entry points for every good and bad pertaining to the pandemic on our continent. They are the entry point for the virus and its place of dispersal throughout the country. But at the same time, they are the place where the fight can be best organized, connecting the effort made at international, national, and local levels of governance. It is also the place where multi-level and multi-stakeholder approaches can take place. It is important that uh, metropolitan leaders and major city leaders understand the leverage effect of the, their metropolises through their interface role. This is lesson number one. Lesson number two, contrary to what people believe, public authorities are still key players in managing any crisis that have impact on a big number of people. In fact, city leaders were the piloting authorities facing the virus, with the national government on the one hand organizing the fight at the national level, and the city government and other local government leading its implementation on the ground. The city government have shown more responsiveness to the fight against the virus because of their proximity to the people. They have been the agents emphasizing preventing preventive health measures, whereas the national level emphasis was on curative health. It is important to note that part of the success witnessed in Africa stems from progress made in the implementation on, of environmental health and hygiene measures by cities, uh, city governments. Lesson number three, COVID has exposed a number of shortcomings in city governments in the preparedness of an organization of relief in case of sanitary and other diseases, including the planning and provision for funeral services. This is an area where city governments should be cooperating more to improve this preparedness. Lesson number four, COVID has proven that the leapfrog effect does work, including in Africa. We have witnessed a serious shift towards the use of digital tools, including in the management of uh, city governments, as illustrated by experiences in cities like Cairo in Egypt, Casablanca in Morocco, Nairobi in Kenya, Kigali in Rwanda, Durban or Cape Town in South Africa, and many more. Of course, there are prerequisites to this. Access to energy, implementation of technology, technologies, infrastructures, existence of skilled labor force in the field of ICT, using in particular the capacities of the youth. This is an area where better cooperation and partnership among cities and local government across uh, uh, the, the world and around digitalization, digitalization can make tremendous difference. Lesson number five, COVID has brought to the fore the need to revisit the development model in African cities since the reduction of movement of goods and people between countries has called the attention on the necessity to reverse the trend of over-dependency of many African cities and countries on imports from and export to the global market. Reviving self-reliance approaches appears to be the unavoidable path towards a post-COVID new normal particularly so in the field of food and health systems, focusing on proximity as a way to mitigate the uncertainty of the future, enhancing energy efficient and circular economy, 
supporting local economic development to improve the, the place of African cities in value chains projections, ensuring import substitution, and adapting people-grounded and people-oriented solutions. Lesson number six, COVID has shown also the necessity to better manage the urbanization process and better organize system of human settlements. There is a, a need for a rethink of the distribution of human settlement across the countries, the regions, and the African continent as a whole. We really need to implement a voluntary geography through special planning that will reverse the trend of over-concentration of people in metropolitan and major cities government. In that regard, more attention should be paid on intermediary and small cities that represent to date 60 percent of the urban population in Africa and will host the bulk of African urbanites in the coming years because they are key in structuring the rural interland and organizing local economies and market intermediary cities and small cities are the the building blocks of any structural transformation of the economies and societies on the African continent. That is why the next African Cities Summit uh, that will be held from uh, the 16th to the 20th of November 2021 is taking place in Kisumu, an intermediary city in Kenya. And they will really invite everybody to come there and share uh, what this intermediary city can bring to the management of uh, our uh, urbanization in Africa. Lesson seven, we need to address the use of urban space, uh, which as it stands now is rather segregated. For example, uh, for, for, to make a city government to be inclusive, safe, economically sound and ecologically sustainable, there is need for a rethink of the way we organize and plan the use of, of uh, city space and, and uh, the planning, management, and use of public space. Public space hosts infrastructure and equipment for public services and is the area of expression of the social compact between the citizens and the public authorities. Hence the importance of public space in the local democratic uh, debate. Lesson uh, number eight and last lesson. We need to learn more about ourselves, about what we do, about what we can learn from international experience, including among, among the metropolitan and the city experiences. This is why setting up a forum of mayors uh, can only reinforce this mutual learning and partnership that will also participate in building the so needed global partnership of cities and metropolis across the world, because uh, we, we, we shall admit definitely that uh, cities are the custodians of the human face of international relations and solidarity. I wish that the uh, UNOS contribute to disseminate these experiences of cities across the world so that the COVID uh, the post-COVID new normal leads towards a world where prevention and anticipation become the guide for action and sustainable development. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Ilong Vasi. Uh, sorry if the, we had problems to connect with you. Um, that's that's the reality. It, it, it normally, we would have you in our forum. Would be we're spending three days with you, and then we can learn a lot of what you have to 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 share for all this those years of experience. I think uh, uh, this virtual learning is very important, uh, and, and then we know we need to do to do more of this uh, together. I hope we will be able to to go to Kisumu, which I know well because I lived in Kenya for some for some years, and then uh, it's, uh, I, I hope we can all join you there. I also hope, I mean, that we'll have you eventually here in Incheon. We tried a few times to invite you in some of those meetings we had, but uh, I would like to thank you very much those 
uh, I, I took note of those eight lessons. This is very uh, thoughtful uh, information. So we would like to, um, of course, to, 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 to disseminate also this information that you, 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 you just share with us. And we hope that you, you, you'll be uh, with us also eventually and us to be with you. We need to collaborate more together. Um, thank you so much. For sure. uh, on this, I, I will uh, go to the next uh, panelist. And um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, the fourth panelist, Ms. Rojalina Ardoy. And um, she will speak about the climate resilience in anti-emergency cities, which is a team that Mr. Bassi was talking but in this time in uh, uh, of Latin America. And uh, then, so Ms. Uh, Jogelina Ardoy, she was trained as a geographer and she is coordinator and senior researcher at the International Institute for Environment and Development Latin America, uh, which in, it's called Instituto Internacional de Medio Ambiente y Desarrollo America Latina. And she's, uh, the, she and the, the, this institute is based in Buenos Aires. Uh, her work focuses on Latin America region, developing multi-stakeholder uh, processes to address environmental conditions, reduce disaster risks, and improve the climate resilience and adaptation capacities. She worked with local communities and local governments, contributing to develop more integrated and transformative urban agendas. So, uh, Ojalina, if you are uh, ready, I will pass you the mic you can take now. Hi, uh, greetings everyone. Thanks you, UN Office for Sustainable Development for ho hosting this meeting. And Jan, your Spanish is much better than my English. Um, I will briefly discuss a few lessons from intermediary cities in Latin America that are building a resilience to climate change. And of course, that helps for the sustainable development goals and also in, in contexts like this responding to the COVID emergency. Next, please. Uh, there's a growing recognition about the role of cities. This meeting is actually about that. And there are many signs of change, uh, as Rina mentioned, cities are game changers and the IPCC's fifth assessment recognized uh, the importance of building resilience to climate change in cities and smaller urban centers and the constraints they face. Uh, however, these recognitions has yet not been translated into the needed support for cities and the governments and where there is support it usually is concentrated in large cities or capital cities. Next. Um, more than half of the, the urban population is concentrated in cities with less than 1 million inhabitants. Uh, Mr. Elongo Mombasi just mentioned that in Africa uh, it's over 60%, in Latin America it's over 54%, the same as in Asia. And one difficulty in, uh, facing any discussion of climate change resilience in cities is that usually uh, climate change policies are not con are what is needed to be done for climate change is not uh, actually part of, 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 of the climate change policy. It falls under other government departments, planning, disaster risk reduction, uh, whatever, but it's, uh, it's outside. So the uh, climate change policies usually have to deal transversely with different sectors. Uh, another is that there are very little, relatively few cases of climate change resilience in intermediary cities with the depth and detail needed to understand what they are doing and, and build from there. However, there are very large overlaps between informal settlements, disaster risk reductions, and action on climate change. These three focus on, on reducing risk, but viewed through different lenses. And together, they, they, they are a good building platform to support further climate change policies sustainable development policies and and responding to different kinds of emergencies. Um, next. From our experience working with city governments in, in the region and reviewing what they are what doing and learning from them, we found that there are seven 
uh, enabling environments or underlying factors that contribute for c to, to cities to develop their climate change policies and help anchor this in a long-term development process. Uh, these play out differently in, in each city, but uh, they, they actually build a very good platform for working. The first is, of course, of course well-governed cities and good governance. We probably all agree that success in climate action is very dependent on the quality and capacity of city governments to plan and implement, also on governments that are accountable to their citizens. Uh, the COVID pandemic just uh, further proved the, the importance of this. A key condition of good governance is, of course, having participatory mechanisms in place so that local residents are part of the decision-making process. I cannot skip mentioning here the role of, of actions as, such as participatory budgeting, grassroots organizations working with local governments, the use of different participatory planning mechanisms that help uh, develop the right solutions for cities and the local institutions that are and teams that are, that are supporting this kind of, of processes and which they become the norm rather than deceptions in cities. Also, local champions have played a key role. Usually it has been a committed a local mayor that has managed to pass the torch to different government administrations. They have also been able to build strong technical teams in cities that, that withstand the changes of administrations. Um, and also community leaders, grassroots organizations, civil societies that have helped cities uh, do things uh, in different ways and prepare a long-term vision for the city, or a long-term development vision for the city. We also found that there's often trigger factors that push cities to change and, and do things differently. It could have been, in many cases, it has been disaster situations uh, or, spe or special opportunities related to uh, an initiative or a very strong urban planning process. A pandemia such as COVID also makes is a, a triggering factor in this sense, uh, which they have made cities start planning with a risk lens, develop a long-term vision, and improve coordination across sectors and actors, which have in turn been useful in developing and implementing their climate change policies and their sustainable development policies. There are also community and grassroots initiatives that have taught authorities to work with vulnerable groups, inform a settlement, a grading, and building resilience with these groups of, of, of within these areas of the cities, as well as the opportunities generated by international initiatives that have provided support and, and helped build a long-term vision for the, for the city. Of course, in this, uh, local capacities and resources are essential. Uh, cities need human technological, financial, political, and social capacities and resources. This has been highlighted in, in, in many meetings and papers. Uh, but also it has been highlighted that the huge constraints cities face in acquiring these capacities and resources and how much of this is tied to the te just technical aspects. However, we find that it's also a very much tied to being able to generate to make the right questions, generate diverse types of information and knowledge that contribute to local decision making and discuss appropriate solutions. In this sense, it is very important for with whom cities partner with, as cities alone cannot cannot as city governments alone cannot take this on forward. Uh, but also these participatory processes involve many actors and, and, and how they collect local knowledge and local perceptions, help prioritize and develop proje projects, etc. Sometimes it's not just about the lack of information, but more about the lack of, of how this information is, is, is shared and the formats in, in which it's presented and, and, the, form, and the barriers uh, which um, so, so the barriers that uh, do not contribute to sharing this information and, and, and make decisions about this. Um, also essential are the capacities to generate financial resources locally uh, to be able to implement 
climate change policies and sustainable development policies. As cities usually get most of their funds transferred from the national level, which are in turn earmarked for specific sectors. So the capacities to, for cities to generate their own resources, such as through local taxes, value capture mechanisms, creating trust or partnering with civil society and the private sector are essential. Also, it's essential how they have become good, better managers and develop capacities to prefer, prepare project proposals that could win the attention of international funders. In this, the process of decentralization at national level has been very key, and we know that the quality and level of decentralization uh, has not always uh, been without problems. It has been taken forward with different depths and often without the actual transfer of resources and capacities and decision-making powers. And tied to this is the existence of national level support for intermediary, intermediary cities. Uh, we've seen in Latin America that often the frameworks that it, the importance of frameworks and strategies that can support intermediary cities, but often many countries are developing their frameworks and, and norms and, and legislation and strategies at the same time as cities. So uh, in, in many aspects, cities have been going forward without that guidance that they need. And also often they have been in turn uh, being uh, examples for the national level to, to learn from them. And last, in many cases, engagement of international agencies and networks has been key in getting more attention to cities and supporting them as they develop their local strategies. As cities gain visibility, they usually attract further support and cooperation. Despite the huge diversity of intermediary cities, there are some strong commonalities between them regarding what worked and what is needed. Next. Uh, we've seen that having a, a local government the res, res, department with responsibility for climate change uh, and sustainable development can ensure that local policies and plans are all aligned and can build alliances across sectors. This connects with the need to have appropriate institutional setups. Often climate change, environmental issues or sustainable development have not an institutional home within municipality structures, so they have little power and little visibility and, and therefore budget. Also, as I mentioned before, develop local information and, and knowledge that, that supports decision making and captures local specifics uh, is key. And this knowledge should be shared and made available. The col collaborative work is essential. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the, the role of, of partnering with other actors, such as universities and local professional groups, that they can not only provide technical support, but also they ensure coherence and continuity of, of, of policies, plans, and planning process. And I, along the way, also the work of, of, of com community organizations, how they, and how they, they build good teams with city governments, and how in turn each one strengthens their capacities to work together. Um, we also see that uh, the importance of acceleration, accelerating the incorporation of climate considerations when investing in settlement grading, housing programs, and key long-lasting infrastructure that in all cases involves allocating important resources. resources. Also, the, the need to revalorize nature-based solutions, green and blue infrastructure, and connecting the urban, peri-urban, and rural areas much better much developing much more in harmony with nature. Also, the how cities have been very good in developing flexible local funding uh, structures, so they could start working, not tapping resources at different moments depending on their needs. Is it would it be more to the very concrete daily needs, but also more to long term planning. Um, and last but not least, uh, the gen opportunities generated by regional and international networks and alliances. As these have shown that they, they, they strengthen local capacities, they visibilize, visibilize uh, intermediary cities in, 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 in discussions and as they become players in national and international 
uh, arenas. And thank you. Thank you very much, Rochalina. Uh, um, well, this is a very interesting uh, presentation. And by the way, your English is very good. <laughs> so don't, uh, don't uh, be, uh, that was a very good presentation. Uh, again, the word, uh, I hear the word collaboration. So um, this is very important. Um, you talk about the capacity to generate resources within the, 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 the cities. And uh, I think the the last I think this presentation will talk a bit uh, about this. Uh, it's a, it's another um, the on asset management. Uh, so that, that that is also uh, very key. Um, attracting the attention of international um, agencies or donors or uh, um, other uh, experts also in, in terms of transfer of uh, of knowledge, capacity building. I I think this is very um, important. Uh, thank you very much for, for this presentation. And I'll go to the next one because we don't have too much time. Uh, unless uh, um, I wanted to ask if, if anyone, maybe uh, even among the first speakers, if they have a question, uh, maybe I, I could do that. Or you may have a question, Rochalina. Uh, um, okay. Um, so, uh, are there anyone among the, the 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 speakers who who want to ask questions in the first to, to the first uh, panelist? So I don't see. Um, okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, then, and then we'll continue now with the next uh, speaker uh, panelist. I just want to let you know that. Uh, also, yes, the, the, the next uh, presentations are kind of related to the, to the next uh, the um, webinars and then uh, also the uh, or trainings that we will uh, hold in the coming weeks and months. So we have like three uh, uh, presenters uh, presentations left. So those three are kind of really directly linked to the the next uh, webinars we will have uh, over the, the, the next weeks and uh, months. So I will call Mr. Uh, Sang Jo Park. Uh, Sang Yong Park. Uh, he's a principal researcher, Korean, Korea Mekong Water Management Collaboration Research Center, K Water. And he will talk about smart city development in South Korea. And uh, I would like to give you a bit of background. Mr. Sang Yong Park is a specialist in integrated water resources management and water diplomacy. He has worked for Korea Water Resources Corporation, K Water, since 2004. After receiving a PhD on urban engineering from the Changbuk National University in the Republic of Korea, um, he worked for the Asia Development Bank and in, in Indonesian Residence Mission as a water resource and project management specialist on the technical assistance projects, uh, enhanced water security investment project and flood risk management for selected river basins project in Indonesia. He also served as a team leader and GIS non-point source specialist of ADB TA technical assistance, I guess, uh, for uh, decision support system development for Indonesian Sitarum uh, River Basin. He served at Korea Water Forum for four years, uh, between 2011 and 2015, as an executive director, and he was involved in more than uh, 100 advocacy activities and policy dialogues, which includes three successive World Water Forums in 2012, in, in France, 2015 in, uh, in Korea, and 2018 in Brasilia, in Brazil. And then as a principal researcher of K-Water, he participated in various national and international projects in the field of international water resource management, water quality preservation, and smart water management. Currently, he's, work, he's working at the Korea Mekong Water Resource Management Collaboration Research Center, uh, which has founded to promote 
the virtual co collaboration among the Republic of Korea and the Mekong region states on the water resource management field. He's leading the smart water management application in the ongoing key C K Korea city project, supported by the Korean Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transportation. So, um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Sang Yong Park, I uh, will uh, pass you the mic. You already have the, 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 the uh, camera uh, with you. So thank you very much for your presentation. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, I would like to share the concept and progress of smart city development in South Korea on behalf of Korean Ministry of Environment. Okay, next, please. According to the economic theory, the quality of service is inversely proportional to the distance, and also the price of service is proportional to the distance. But how will it be with the digital transformation and pandemic situation? Next, please. The paradigm of city has been constantly transforming even now. The concept of green city has long history, and the city of development has been converted with various contemporary fields such as sustainable development, climate change, and inclusive growth. Now the paradigm is as much city. Next, please. Listen to me. Korean government released Korean New Deal policy for the responding measure toward post-corona and new normal era. The key word is digital New Deal and Green New Deal which is a national strategy for a great transformation to share national development strategy to support countries' recovery from the pandemic crisis and lead the global action against structural changes with the international community. Next, please. The SMART, as well as Green City, is the key strategy of Green New Deal in Korea. The core concept is to develop SMART Green City model through confluence of the Digital New Deal and Green New Deal by the customized smart green solution considering regional context and infrastructure for improving quality of life. Next, please. The future proof city, Prasanna Godeta Smarty, I'm going to deliver the, the concept and vision and those technology applied in this smart city development. Next, please. So Busan Equidata City is located at the southern coast of Korean Peninsula, which is close to Kimhae International Airport and Sunport. The EDC will be constructed as a waterfront city with the surrounding rivers. Next, please. The smart city as a national pilot city started year 2017, and now we are preparing the demonstration and pilot operation. Next, please. The total area is 11.7 cubic kilometers for population of 76,000 people for 30,000 households. Next, please. The smart city area is 2.8 cubic kilometers, about 25% of total size, and the design population is 8,500 people. Next, please. The vision of EDC is an innovative, growing global city that takes the future life forward by converging nature, human, and technology. Next, please. The core value is fostering the technologies of, of the fourth industrial revolution and improving the quality of life. Next, please. Uh, this slide shows the key area of development in EDC. It issue will be a space that contains technologies such as 10 innovative technologies that add values to quality of life with future readiness, citizen engagement, and, and global cooperation. Next, please. The 10 innovative te technologies improve quality of life, even EDC, are life innovation with low bad smart water and smart healthcare and mobility and necessity. Next, please. EDC will be developed 
developed as a water petrolite city from the urban design basis, considering waterfront eco city design and urban water cycle restoration. EDC will create a global urban brand and improve the quality of life of citizens by leveraging water and waterfront. We will develop as an attractive, people-oriented city which connects nature, people, technologies, utilizing the potential of Samuel Mori, which means that we live on mid come from the place. Next, please. The paradigm has been shifted from urban greening to the water circulation of the entire city. It is will apply restoration of the unconnected water circulation and create a water specialized city. We'll apply smart water management technology based on 50 years water management know-how, such as Netflix. Urban water related digital service system will be implemented with small size precipitation forecasting radar and water digester management system. Next, please. Water digester management system will monitor water management infrastructures. Next, please. The city will be developed based on low impact development concept. The city covered with greenery and Garden instead of concrete pavement. Next, please. The river water quality will be improved by applying so called eco filtering technology nearby site. Next, please. Smart water management will be applied, which is ICT application in water supply process from source to tap for real time monitoring and remote control water quality and quantity. Next, please. Advanced small scale treatment facility will be built in the city, minimizing the distance and to ensure the quality of drinking water. Next, please. Wastewater will be reused for cleaning in stream water and for water farm fire water recycling. Next, please. And then lastly, the hydrothermal energy will be introduced, which will cover the heat, heat sources from river and lake and will be used for heating and cooling or a hot water supply to the building. Well, today, uh, my presentation is uh, relatively focused on those technology aspects and those development staging and what have been done so far. So I would like to share those information with the information we will give those as today. Thank you. Thanks for, li thanks for listening. Thank you very much for uh, telling us, uh, uh, presenting about this very interesting uh, project, the Smart City Development in South Korea, but also this uh, pilot project. I have a question uh, just quickly, and maybe I missed. Uh, when is this uh, pilot project will be complete? Do you have a, a year or over how many years this will be? Uh, well, we uh, we have initiated this project year 2017, and now uh, we we selected the the future agency. So it takes about well year 2000. Let me, let me check it. So it's already uh, well advanced. Yeah. We we we, yeah. we just initiated. We just initiated. We finished the master plan and we select the institution agency. Okay. So it will take yeah. A few years. Well, I mean, we, uh, thank you very okay. much. For, Maybe. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for for this. And then, as I mentioned, uh, people will have the opportunity to hear more about it because we'll have uh, a full webinar on uh, smart city uh, development, not only in Korea, but of course that uh, we will have uh, the opportunity to hear more about this project uh, in the next uh, if you, uh, 
upcoming webinars in the coming weeks or coming months. So thank you so much for, for this presentation. Um, I will, we don't have much time, so I will go quickly to the next uh, presenter. So Mr. Uh, Kasung Chige uh, Endo, Director of the United Nations Center for Regional Development in Nagoya. And the team will be uh, climate change, um, uh, smart city and resilient city, SDG monitoring and evaluation tools. Again, and this is also connected to um, to the two uh, some some uh, webinars we will hold in, in the in the near future. So uh, just a few words about Mr. Kasunge uh, Shige Endo. He assumed the position of director of the UNCRD, UN Center for Regional Development, in Nagoya uh, since August uh, eight, uh, 2018. Prior to do to this. He was direct, uh, Deputy Director General of the Great East Japan Earthquake, which happened uh, in, in March uh, 2011, as you know. And the reconstruction projects in the Iwati Office, the construction agency, the Cabinet uh, Secretariat. He joined the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport, and Tourism in 1990, he, following his graduation for the, from the Tokyo, uh, Kyoto, sorry. Uh, Kyoto University. He had the Masters of Transport Engineering. His career in Japan covers more than 10 engineering positions at the government headquarters, the na national highway management offices, and local authorities. He transferred to the, the Japanese, uh, sorry, the Japan International Corporation Agency and the World Bank as senior highway engineers, transport uh, and ICT global practice in the African region between 2012 and 2015, and has had various experience in international development projects. He's a certified professional engineer, engineer from Japan and the APEC, APEC engineer. So, uh, Mr. Endo, I will uh, let, give you the mic. Welcome, and thank you very much for your presentation. Please go ahead. Hmm. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dragon. Can you hear me? I think it's okay. We see you, we see your slides, so everything is fine. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, my presentation uh, in the important mayor's forum. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my presentation is Climate Change, Smart and Resilient Cities, uh, SDG Monitoring and Evaluation Tools. <laughs> So first, briefly talk about uh, our organization, UNCLD. Uh, we are just like uh, UNOSD in Korea, uh, belonging uh, to the UNDESA. Uh, we located in Nagoya a City in Japan as the third largest city. Uh, so our main uh, areas of work is uh, uh, the smart city, uh, EST3R, uh, DRR, uh, so please um, put uh, those uh, terminology uh, in your uh, uh, heads uh, or while I use uh, those terminology uh, again and again uh, in my presentation. <coughs> so uh, our activities are centered around uh, urban management uh, policies and planning. Slide shows urban management uh, sectors. Today, I will uh, talk about uh, smart city, uh, the transport, uh, disaster risk reduction, climate change, and then uh, SDG monitoring and uh, evaluation tools. So, uh, the smart city is an inno innovative uh, city with use of the uh, ICT uh, technologies. Uh, now, UNCRD is uh, preparing for a new smart city uh, program uh, with financial support of the uh, Japanese government. Uh, we would like to make collaboration with the city uh, government and the mayors uh, on the smart city initiative. So the smart city uh, fundamentals are integrated approaches through a smart ICT technology. The slide shows a key sectors uh, that should be managed in an integrated uh, manner. UNCLD 
uh, supported uh, cities and uh, countries uh, in managing uh, some of the uh, key sectors. Those are uh, disaster risk reduction, uh, transport, uh, ESP, uh, or serial uh, waste management. <coughs> Uh, the first uh, DRR sector, UNCRD works as a secretariat of a high-level expert and leaders panel on water and disasters uh, called HELP. So HELP organizes high-level meetings uh, twice a year, uh, shown in slide, to support countries in strengthening disaster prevention and disaster awareness preparedness. The uh, chairman of uh, HELP is Dr. Han Sun Su, a special envoy of UN uh, Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction and Water. He is a former uh, Korean uh, Prime Minister. So slide shows our uh, most recent activity. Uh, so that's the online conference of uh, water-related DRR and COVID-19. So those are facts uh, we discussed. Uh, so for example, uh, the, the bullet point three, uh, DRR emergency responses and the COVID-19, uh, the healthcare responses do not uh, go together uh, and competing. So, so then the bullet number five, uh, help around the uh, principles to address water-related disaster risk reduction under uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. It was launched uh, in May this year. Uh, so the next month in Japan, flooding disaster occurred in June. Uh, so the principles uh, helped uh, the uh, local uh, region. So, so, you know, the global action uh, help local disasters. So, the, the, this slide shows the, the discussion on uh, climate change uh, by health. Uh, so, the, the, for example, uh, the disaster risk, um, direct, mm, oh, I skipped this. Uh, so, for example, uh, more data and better tools for uh, risk assessment uh, needs uh, to be deployed to identify and uh, prioritize actions. So those uh, discussions uh, contribute uh, to climate uh, change actions. So next, uh, the transport, uh, next transport sector, uh, shown in the uh, slide, uh, UNCRD organized uh, the ESP forum, a transport conference uh, every year in some of uh, Asian uh, cities. Uh, so EST supports uh, countries and cities in Asia in transport policies and uh, projects. Last year, uh, Vietnam, uh, Hanoi hosted uh, EST forum. The forum title was uh, Smart City. Uh, so in the, uh, the end of the uh, forum, uh, member countries and the cities adopted the Hanoi Declaration on the smart cities through EST solution. So this is uh, the recent, most recent activity uh, of uh, the EST uh, transport conference. Uh, the title is uh, Transport uh, in the Aftermath of COVID-19. So uh, that uh, you know, uh, uh, organized the, uh, the last uh, last month. Uh, for example, uh, how uh, can we uh, build back to better uh, the public transportation system uh, after um, aftermath of COVID-19? So those are facts uh, we discussed. Uh, participants uh, shared experiences and lessons. Uh, so it means, I believe, uh, global uh, level discussions will help local local problems. So now uh, we are working on new EST uh, declaration. Our target year is 2030. So six goals are proposed. Uh, the, the goal one uh, contributes to the climate change action that uh, uh, environment sustainability, uh, low, low carbon, uh, low, low carbon uh, cities. Uh, so, so the, my first, uh, my first uh, message uh, is uh, global action and uh, discussions in key sectors are very, very essential uh, for smart cities.
So um, now uh, I move on the uh, uh, second half of the presentation. That's uh, the monitoring and evaluation tools uh, for uh, SDG local actions uh, for local uh, city government. <clears throat> so um, I just uh, talk about uh, the project back, uh, background from pers perspective of local trend. So uh, for example, in Japan, 80% of the local government uh, are doing something uh, to, to achieve SDGs. So the next, uh, uh, also background uh, from a global trend. So global interest uh, are now on the, the implementation and evaluation monitoring. Uh, so then the voluntary uh, VLR uh, is uh, so somehow uh, moving. So the development of uh, evaluation indicators uh, are very important for uh, local local government. <clears throat> so so therefore, UNCRD launched the project to develop uh, a monitoring and evaluation tool. Uh, UNCRD uh, works to develop a mechanism to monitor, evaluate uh, the the SDGs implementation. So the, the tools uh, enable uh, local government to evaluate, uh, visualize uh, output and outcomes of their SDG activities. So, so, so then uh, this is our, our partner organization. We work with uh, the Nagoya City and uh, Toyota City and also the private sector, uh, the Tupan uh, companies and uh, SD Japan and uh, Nippon engineering consultant. Uh, this uh, project is uh, the, the partnership project. So please look at uh, our project overview. Uh, the, the, the tools are divided into three, the data collection tools and then the evaluation tools and then information dissemination uh, tools. Uh, so the, the detailed uh, activities uh, are shown in this slide. Uh, so the first bullet point are uh, combine the statistical uh, data uh, with uh, the big data, uh, for example, participatory uh, data collection technology. And also we evaluate the current status of uh, the, the local government. Uh, we did a case study uh, with Nagoya City and uh, Toyota City. And then the basic guideline of uh, evaluation and the monitoring tool uh, will be compiled for uh, the local government. The expected uh, impact uh, will be the, the result of monitoring and evaluation will be easily reported uh, on an annual uh, basis and visualized uh, the online. Uh, so the, this um, the tools uh, will be utilized in any uh, countries and uh, cities. Um, so this is uh, the project uh, schedule. Um, so this is uh, uh, just a one-year uh, project. Um, the, the guideline will be released uh, next spring. So then after the, the guideline for uh, the local government, uh, uh, we'll start to uh, develop uh, the, uh, the evaluation and the monitoring tool for a private uh, company. So uh, second uh, half uh, of my message is um, the, the SDG evaluation tool is a uh, key key to success uh, for local uh, action, local uh, government. So thank you very much and thank you for your attention. <clears throat> thank you, thank you so much, uh, Endosan, for your presentation. Actually, you presented on two teams, the climate change and smart city and resilient cities, and the SDG monitoring and evaluation. So these two uh, teams will be uh, presented in uh, uh, webinars uh, specifically on, on uh, uh, each one on, on those teams. So um, in, in, in the near future, thank you very much uh, for, for this presentation. I will go uh, quickly to the last presentation. So while we had one person presenting on two uh, teams, now we'll have two person presenting on one, uh, making one presentation together on uh, the team uh, of um, 
managing infrastructure assets for sustainable cities. This is something that we discussed a bit uh, earlier. We have Ms. Caroline, Caroline uh, Lombardo, Chief uh, International Tax and Development Corporation Branch, and Mr. Daniel Platt, e Economic Affairs Officer at the Financing or Development Office, the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, uh, UNDESA. And um, so again, the, the, the title is Managing Infrastructure in Assets for Sustainable Cities. I'd like to give you uh, the background uh, of Ms. Uh, uh, Lombardo and uh, Mr. Platt. So Ms. Caroline uh, Lombardo serves as a chief on the International Tax and Development Corporation branch. Um, uh, in the Financing for Sustainable Development Office of the UN DESA. She leads the UN teams uh, uh, that provide tax policy and capacity building support on tax and domestic resource mobilization. So, uh, and that provides uh, to the Secretariat, to the ex UN Committee of Experts on International Cooperation in Tax Matters and to the Development Cooperation Forum. Ms. Lombardo previously served uh, in the Strategic Planning Unit at UNDESA and uh, had an earlier tour in the Policy Planning Unit of uh, the Executive Office of the Secretary General. She did a postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University where she helped design and launch the program in Grand Strategy and its uh, multidisciplinary graduate course addressing large scale long-term strategic challenges of uh, statecraft, politics, and social change. Ms. Lombardo uh, was a British Marshall uh, scholar and holds a doctorate and master's in international history and politics from University of Oxford and a bachelor's degree in ethics, politics, and economics from Yale University. I will uh, also uh, introducing Mr. Platts. Daniel Platts works also at the financial Financing for Development Office of the UNDESA, where he currently coordinates technical assistance and uh, capacity development work on infrastructure asset management for local and national governments. He has over 20 years of experience with UN intergovernmental processes, uh, research in ana analytics and technical assistance in support of the implementation of the UN development agenda, including the SDGs. Yeah, sustainable development goals. He has published widely in the area of development finance, municipal finance, and infrastructure. He holds a PhD in economics and a master's in uh, global politics and economy and finance from the New School University. Uh, he also received uh, he received his bachelor degree uh, in political science and economics from Goethe University in Frankfurt, uh, Germany. So. Um, Time is very uh, getting short, so I will uh, pass you the mic right away. So um, please, I think uh, Miss Carolina will uh, start. Um, are you online? Yes, yes. Thank you, Jan, yep. and okay. thank you so thank much you. for inviting us here and distinguished colleagues and participants. So we are going to make a two-person but speedy presentation <laughs> and we want to um, focus on two things. One is making a really strong case for infrastructure asset management in support of SDGs and sustainable cities. And then we want to share the very practical capacity development tools that UNDESA is offering to local governments in this regard. Next slide, please. So this gets to the very roots of the project and why we do it. The Addis Ababa Action Agenda on Financing for Sustainable Development very specifically recognize the need for capacity development at local level for financing the SDGs. And one overlooked but high impact area for capacity support at local level is infrastructure asset management, especially in this COVID-19 recovery and response context. Next slide, please. So infrastructure asset management, governments around the world are looking into innovative financing mechanisms for SDGs and including infrastructure financing gaps, how to fill them. But such efforts often do not budget for the resources, financial, human, material that are needed to manage infrastructure assets over time, over their entire lifespan. 
So these assets, what are they? Traditional infrastructure facilities, land, buildings, equipment needed to operate and maintain them. Good asset management has a number of distinctive features, involves assessing trade-offs of decisions, managing assets over entire life cycle, taking a portfolio management approach that looks at the value of entire portfolio, interdependent risks and co-benefits, and key organizational culture that's backed with adequate financial human material resources to enable and sustain good asset management over time. Next slide, please. So linking good asset management to good budgeting. <laughs> As our colleague from UCLG noted, the actual cost to construct or acquire infrastructure asset may be only 15 to 30% of the overall expenditure. 70 to 85% of the costs of the assets are incurred after it is bought or built. So good asset management is really important for budgeting and for strengthening the sustainability of public infrastructure investment. And this has a number of really important effects. The financial viability of the local government will be enhanced because costs are anticipated, reserves are set aside, and proactive yeah. maintenance will reduce costs. This also leads to greater creditworthiness of the local governments, which is really critical to help mobilize new investment. So this is why in 2017, we partnered with the UN Capital Development Fund, and we began to design and implement a comprehensive asset management tool, specifically for local governments in developing countries to help unlock these financial benefits. Next slide, please. We've been working with four governments, Bangladesh, Nepal, Tanzania, Uganda, to refine the toolkit under real world conditions, including in this COVID context, done scoping missions, technical assistance, training of trainers, and now we're in ongoing support phase for implementation of the asset management action plans. We see really steady uptake here with over 40 municipalities and districts having designed or begun to implement the asset management action plan. Backed, for example, in Uganda by a directive from Ministry of Finance to have each local government allocate the budget for these asset management action plans. Next slide, please. And so here we come to a handbook with where we bring together the lessons learned from the four years experience in the field so far. And I'm going to hand over here to Daniel, who's going to take you through the handbook and the practical tools that come with it. Over to you, Daniel. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, um, for giving us the opportunity to pre present this work. So the, the Handbook on Infrastructure Asset Management is really uh, an exciting new compilation of toolkits uh, that we can offer local and national governments um, around the world. It is almost done. Uh, we will uh, officially launch it mid-January. Um, and it consists of two parts. The first part is called fundamentals. And here we really introduce everyone in very straightforward, direct, and, and easy to digest language, we hope, to the concept of asset management, um, to the importance of having a framework for asset management that is rooted in community needs, um, through concrete tools that we've developed. And I'll talk about those in a second a little bit more. There's one tool that uh, we refer to as the diagnostic tool or diagnostic tool on asset management. And the other tool uh, we refer to as AMAPs or asset management action plans. Caroline just mentioned those already. Um, so these are field tested tools that we introduce to the reader in part one. Part two uh, are what in the in the corporate world probably would be called the deep dives um, or in focus chapters. Um, we have really four um, uh, deep dives of in focus chapters uh, on four topics. The first one deals with the question of data. How do we know which data 
to collect and which data not to collect because data collection can be resource intensive, is usually resource intensive. And how do we de develop a, an asset management information system with that data? Data in itself is, is, is raw. It doesn't, it's not necessarily useful. We have to turn that into an information system. So we have very concrete, uh, very simple ideas for um, cities. And we're not talking about the mega cities, the cities we've just heard about that, you know, know all of this, right? Um, these are probably um, a tools that are most suitable for um, secondary cities and 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 uh, and, and below um, so we have this this chapter on data um, we have a chapter on climate resilient infrastructure uh, we have a chapter on emergency response amap so this is our COVID chapter, so it really deals with how to adjust uh, our asset management action plans to emergencies like COVID. And finally, a chapter on enabling environment. This really talks to the national government officials more than the local government officials and talks about the sort of the um, regulatory legislative environment that is helpful for asset management. Um, next slide, please. So here's just a snapshot, and I really won't go into any detail of the asset management diagnostic tool. Um, the way it works really is we, we send um, whoever is interested, uh, uh, you know, this could be a national government, it could be local governments, um, will get a training in the application of this tool. If there are resources um, and someone can actually help the local government uh, uh, assess this, uh, that that's, of course, the preferred option. So this could either be, um, you know, a, a donor agency, this could be the UN, um, but uh, ideally, it would be someone locally from the central government. Um, and the way it works is that the, the city uh, first does a self assessment that is very simple and just sort of answers a bunch of uh, important questions, you know, what assets do you own? Where are they? Who's involved in managing those assets? And then there's an on-site assessment that is a, a little bit more involved, maybe take, you know, um, two, three, four days. It is not really uh, super detailed in a sense that every asset will be uh, uh, looked at and, 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 and assessed. It is more about the organizational culture, really. Uh, is there an organizational culture that uh, already uh, incorporates asset management or is it conducive to such uh, an approach? And then finally, part three is an evaluation and recommendation of interventions. And then you have, a, as you see on the right side, a little bit of a scoring table where you see a different areas of asset management. Where are we with, with, with that local government or the national government, whoever does that assessment? And where can, can we realistically land in about two years or so? And what needs to be done to, to get there? Uh, next slide, please. And the, the, again, I won't go into detail, the other big tool that is already tested, field tested, is the Asset Management Action Plan. And what we, we've done here is really, um, in our workshops, we have a step-by-step -step approach. Um, so our instructors would, um, you know, which are, you know, the instructors are international, national, there's an, a nice mix of, of, of uh, um, a, a pool of instructors that we've built up over time now, and uh, they take you through step one, you know, which in this uh, case would be uh, introduce or establish an asset management framework and really think about the basic principles that you want to have. They could be as simple as, you know, we don't want to abuse our assets. We want to make sure they are, um, you know, uh, we'll never abuse them. We're sure, we want to make sure they are serving community needs and so forth. So it's, it's very basic, the first step. Um, we'll walk uh, participants and workshops through such a module and then uh, we let them uh, work it out. Uh, so the, the modules that we've been teaching on the ground are always followed by an interactive session where the different four or five people involved in asset management of a local government, uh, mostly technical people, um, will work uh, uh, through that step and put something on paper, right? And so we have step one to five. Uh, and in the end, you have identified hopefully some gaps and you have a, a plan to improve asset management. And, and what we say is focus on a priority asset. Don't focus on all of your assets. Uh, we've talked about water a lot today. So, you know, that, that is a very common asset, uh, the, the, the water and sanitation system, uh, every physical assets that is part of that, solid waste management, uh, infrastructure facilities, uh, the vehicle fleet, the landfill. These are typical assets that local governments choose. And then they sort of put together a, um, 10 step, 15 step plan over the next two, three years on how to improve that process, management process around that particular asset. And if that works out well, 
you can move on to the next priority asset. So it's a very simple, um, basic uh, plan, and it requires um, uh, local government officials to be actively part of the design and implementation process. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a busy slide, sorry for that. But in addition to these two tools that we've just mentioned and which are um, uh, that are embedded in, in the in the handbook, and really, uh, you know, we're going into some detail on, in terms of how to implement them. We've had, we also developed new tools um, that we will hopefully be able to field test in the next uh, uh, a year or so. Um, there is the uh, data chapter that I referred to earlier uh, as well. Uh, uh, there's the climate resilience chapter, which teaches um, local governments that you know want some capacity in that in that field how to assess climate risks and how to decide when to do something about certain assets and then we have the health emergency uh, chapter that uh, you know builds on the COVID-19 experience and we've seen of course that local governments around the world were really at the forefront of the response but it has very concrete uh, implications such a health emergency on assets. Um, you know, your priority asset may change. It may not be the school anymore. It may be the hospital when you have a health emergency. So how do you decide which one is your priority asset now? How do you adjust your asset management action plans to those uh, uh, um, uh, emergency situations? That is part of that chapter. Next slide, please. Um, these are just two slides now my last two slides uh, on, on some of the key takeaways of the chapter of the handbook um and you know you will all have access to this uh, presentation so i will not go through them in in detail um but uh, you know basically the, the the key message here is that um you need to approach asset management as a life cycle exercise you really need to think about all the different uh, 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 phases of the life cycle and make the right human financial material provisions for that. And as Caroline mentioned earlier and others too, uh, there is of course this this uh, really um, striking um, insight that most of the expenditures that relate to asset management come after the acquisition phase. Um, it's 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 not new in any way, but it's often forgotten. Right. So um, the, one of the basic insights is really that each asset has a unique set of human material and financial resources associated with it. And we need to look at those implications first before we even decide on acquiring that asset. Um, because if we don't have the financial resources, if we don't have the human resources, if we don't have the materials locally available, investing in such an asset or building such an asset may not be the wise choice. It may be better not to do uh, anything at all um, before we have an asset that fails and uh, is, is a, you know, uh, uh, eating up a lot of uh, resources. Um, but, you know, if we take that all into account, obviously, asset management investment makes sense. Um, we already talked about the diagnostics, the tools that we have, the dynamics um, I won't go into. Um, we, in some detail, go into that in, in, the, in the chapter. Um, Action plans were mentioned already. The, I, I mentioned the importance to focus on a priority asset once you have an asset management action plan in place. Um, here are some of the uh, critical steps. Uh, we have a template for those asset management action plans, right? And in that the template, what, what, what governments do, they will start with a stakeholder analysis. Who is involved in managing solid waste management? Who, what type of technical people? What is their influence? What is their impact? What is their interest in that asset? Right. What is the demand on that asset? How do we do uh, effective performance projections and demand projections? Um, what are the gaps in our current procedures in managing that asset um, compared to where we want to be? And what are the corrective actions we can take? So these are the different steps of the asset management action plan um, that we walk the reader through um, in, in the handbook. And uh, last slide for me before I give it over to, to Caroline. Next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned before, the four chapters on uh, uh, the, the deep dive, the in-focus uh, chapters, um, key insight on the data chapter that you really need to have a at least a very basic structural hierarchical asset registry in place in order to do proper asset management. Um, uh, you need to think about climate change. Climate change, as we know, is it's an it's an urban issue, and the more urbanization happens, the more 
um, uh, uh, pressure and strain we will uh, experience on local assets. And climate change has a there's a direct link to to urbanization, right? I mean, in, in a lot of developing countries, we see that uh, uh, employment in the agricultural sector is going down. This has to do with efficiencies and efficiency gains, as much as also climate change, where you know the agricultural sector is really not um, uh, uh, functional anymore in some some countries, and so those. Uh, um, uh, citizens may move to um, to to the bigger cities, and once uh, the the mega city is saturated, they will move on to the secondary cities, and those are really not prepared um, for uh, this urbanization trend, right? And so you need to think about direct and indirect uh, complications uh, associated with climate change, and we do walk, as I said before, the reader through a very basic um, uh, tool there in order to assess the risk and really to decide. Uh, when to do something, but also when to do nothing, because uh, not every asset is equally affected. Some assets may actually benefit from it. Most of them will not, but you have to look at each asset separately. Um, and then uh, lastly, the enabling environment, as I, as I mentioned before, really important um, to have a asset management culture supported through the right national institutional environment. There needs to be sound legislation, policies and practices in place that local government can easily access and that they can relate their asset management procedures to. You know, sometimes, for example, uh, performance targets are, uh, you know, the, the, the student uh, uh, teacher ratio may be nationally determined, right? So then that has to be known and it has to be very, very easily uh, accessible for local governments. Um, what that means, um, you know, there may be some uh, uh rules and regulations on the asset registry how to build it what data to include um how to depreciate your asset you know and and all these uh um uh, uh legislations and policies um should be coherent and consistent and often what we find there's no such coherent policy in place and local governments really have trouble to you know pick and choose and, and and see what is really needed to do sound asset management and what are really the national policies to take into consideration. Um, enough about the handbook. I'm going to hand it over to Caroline to talk a little bit about the next steps and how you all can get involved. Thank you. Next slide, please, for Caroline. Thanks so much. So just very quickly, we're working on three three things to make the handbook more accessible and disseminate it as widely as possible. First, and really important, we want to keep translating it into languages. You'll see the languages there on the screen. We are also launching a series of online solutions dialogue, very interactive setting where local authorities can participate in workshops organized by theme um, in regions over uh, the next few months to have really interactive space to go through the handbook together and exchange experience, have some peer learning. We're also building a MOOC, massive online open course. So at your own pace, uh, in your own uh, perch, from your own perch, you can go through um, the whole handbook and into the deep dives and all of the tools Daniel just took you through. And then lastly, I want to mention we have also an informal advisory board of experts on infrastructure asset management that's helping to guide especially the MOOC, um, but also this, this wider effort and everything involved. And so we really welcome everyone in this call and in this conference forum and all of your networks to please be a part of it and, and reach out to us. We're really keen to keep working on this. It's a major way we're looking at um, financing policies and tools that can really help reduce risk and build resilience for sustainable development and the local authorities are right there on the front line. So this is why the tools are designed for you. So thank you so much. Back back to you, Jean. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline and uh, and Danielle, uh, for for this uh, very interesting presentation. Again, uh, like the I was mentioning, the three last presentations were really related to webinars and or uh, training uh, sessions that we are putting together for the next uh, weeks or, or, or months and months, I, I should say. And then uh, I want to uh, stress that, uh, I mean, this is, this is very, uh, for example, this last presentation, uh, the asset management uh, uh, plan and uh, uh, infrastructure asset management is a very complex and then, uh, of course, it's uh, <laughs> you did a wonderful job to present this in a very uh, short uh, time. But I want to, to say also that uh, 
we are uh, discussing in discussion uh, discussion together to uh, turn this to uh, uh, maybe uh, a few webinars or training sessions. Uh, well, uh, we will uh, discuss the different aspects a bit more in detail. And uh, maybe it would be three uh, different uh, webinars on, on this. I think it's very uh, it's very exciting to see that. I mean, some uh, presentation when uh, Orgelina, she presented uh, earlier, she was talking about financing. Uh, to uh, I mean, this is a very uh, important issue, how you, you manage those uh, those assets. And uh, as uh, Daniel said, sometimes you, you do nothing. In some cases, you know, you have to, to understand your, your system. This is uh, very, very important that, um, oh, sorry. Uh, I would like to say, I mean, this this is very uh, illustrative of what we're trying to do with the with the mayor's forum. We want to uh, this to be to bring uh, you know tools to to bring solutions or uh, to address or solve concrete issues that the local governments are are dealing uh, with, and that's one very uh, important one. And then. Uh, uh, well, thank you very much for, for uh, this uh, great presentation on that. I'd like also to uh, uh, say, thank Ms. Uh, uh, Endosan again, uh, because this is also uh, uh, technical uh, uh, aspects or <clears throat> issues that uh, cities are also uh, dealing with. So uh, we will also have this uh, webinar or two actually in, in the future with, with this. And of course, uh, uh, I'm going back to the to the um, smart city development. We heard about about it uh, today. So th this is another um, issue or topic that we will address in the near future. Uh, I don't think we have time. I mean, at this end of the world, it's uh, twelve thirty, you know, in the in the morning. So we kind of kind of very uh, it's very late for for us. But uh, so we don't have time for very much for the questions, but I would like to uh, um, to thank you all, all the presenters, all the, the, the opening speakers, um, and then the presenters. So um, the opening remarks, I will say Mr. Uh, Chong Kyu Park, the head of the, the UNOSD, uh, the uh, Honorable uh, Myung Rae Cho, Minister of the Environment, um, his, his Excellency, sorry, and, and then the Honorable Mr. Nanchung Park, the Mayor of Incheon uh, Metropolitan City, uh, Mr. Anson Sibanda, um, Chief of uh, National Strategies Capacity Building Branch at the UNDESA, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Rina Jusila, uh, Sustainable Development Officer, also UNDESA, Jean-Pierre uh, Elong Mbassi, Secretary General, uh, UCLG Africa, Bernardia Iwarati uh, Tandadewi, uh, also UCLG, but ASPAC in the uh, Asia Pacific, Ojelina uh, Ardoy, uh, President of the Instituto Internacional de Medio Ambiente y Desarrollo, America Latina, uh, Sang, -Jung, Sang Yung Park, Principal Researcher, Corinne Mekong. Uh, Water Management Collaboration Research Center, OK Water. Um, Mr. Kasungi, Kasungshi Ge, sorry, Endo, Director of United uh, Nations Center for uh, Regional Development. And you, Ms. Uh, Car Caroline uh, Lombardo, uh, Chief International Tax Development Corporation Branch, and Daniel Platz, Economic Officer of Financing for Sustainable Development Office at the UNDESA as well. I would like to thank the uh, also the uh, the audience and and I, I would like to uh, also to ask you um, you can uh, please contact us uh, I thank you uh, thank you for the for the comments we had also on the uh, uh, local government's needs for capacity development we want to to pursue in that uh, that area many of the speakers uh, Helena, I think also she, she's uh, raised these issues. Um, we want to, to continue with that. So I want to thank you very much. And I would like to all to uh, ask you to follow us on the, our website, unosd.un.org. Uh, 
to to see the next the next dates uh, of the, the the dates and the teams um, the, of the next uh, mayor's forum related uh, webinars and capacity building events that we'll have uh, soon and then uh, yeah we we we're also looking forward to have you in Incheon. Uh, eventually, we we hope to have the, the next in-person uh, mayors forum uh, in Incheon, and then we go around the world as we I mentioned earlier in different uh, uh, on different continents and different places. So I'd like to thank you all uh, again, and uh, I wish we will meet in uh, in the forum very soon or. Uh, a webinar or uh, 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 another uh, learning courses on the topics that we discussed tonight. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, I will. I would like to. Oh, sorry. I, I wanted to say thank you for uh, all the the speakers. I said the speakers, the participants, but also the UNOSD staff who were involved in the mayor's forum. I want to. Um, uh, yeah, they work hard. Uh, we don't see them, but uh, they, they make this uh, also uh, a success. And uh, the recordings of this webinar, I want to say, it will be on our website in the next couple of days, as well as uh, reports on this. So again, thank you very much, very, very much uh, for your very uh, um, interesting presentations. And uh, um, yeah, uh, I would like to... Uh, Again, con, you know, um, invite you to, to, to follow us and we will contact you all for the next steps of the Mayor's Forum. And a good, uh, good day, evening, afternoon, good night on this side of the, of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.